So Doug and Scott work on Security Onion, and Security Onion has um, given us leaps and bounds in terms of users in the Bro community, but we have no idea who they are. So, um, and most of them don't know who we are, which is sort of a weird experience where they're running Bro and they don't exactly realize it, but that's fine. It's the data. It's important. Um, so anyway, I don't want to say anything that may interfere with their talk, so I'll let them go ahead and go if they're ready. Stop it, stop it. Far too kind. So as Seth said, we are those Security Onion guys. I'm Doug Burks, and that's Scott Mumford, I mean Scott Runnels. I always have to tease him about Mumford and Sons because, well, there you go. Uh, so we are the two core developers of Security Onion, and we also use Security Onion, so we're not only the president, we're a, we're a client as well. Right? We use Security Onion and Bro to help defend our uh, lovely employer, Mandiant. And oh, by the way, Mandiant always has really cool jobs if anybody is interested. I know Mr. David Bianco, raise your hand, is hiring some folks. So he's got some really cool jobs. So you can talk to him or me or Scott or Richard or any uh, Mandiant employee who may be stalking the room right now uh, if you're interested. And if you are one of those live tweeter types, you can live tweet this talk using hashtag security onion. So I imagine most of you folks already know, but for those who don't, what is security onion? It's a Linux distro, a free Linux distro for intrusion detection and network security monitoring. So we've got all the greatest free open source security tools like Bro, like Snort and Suricata. We've got four interfaces for you to choose from, Squeal, Squirt, Snorby, and Elsa. We've got PCAP analysis tools like Explico, Network Miner, and very, other, uh, very many other cool tools. Now, you get all these cool tools just by clicking next, next, finish. So any old Windows admin off the street can deploy Bro to their network in just a few minutes. So a little bit of the history of Security Onion and Bro. I released the very first version of Security Onion in 2009. In June of that year, I added Bro. I think it was probably Bro 1.5 or something. Uh, I attended Bro Exchange right here in 2011. Then Bro 2.0 came out. So we rolled that out to our users at the beginning of 2012. And 2012 was a very big year for Security Onion because Ubuntu, which the distro is based on, came out with their 12.04 release, so it was time to rebuild the distro from scratch, which allowed us to fix a lot of deficiencies in the project and make it a lot more enterprise worthy. So we did some very cool things uh, in that we started with Launchpad. So all of our software is hosted in a Launchpad PPA, Personal Package Archive. That allows us to support both 32-bit and 64-bit architectures at the same time. Now, of course, if you're running enterprise deployments, you want to do 64-bit. So that's what our ISO image is. You download our Security Onion ISO image, you've got 64-bit. Uh, we've got NetSniffNG doing very high performance, full packet capture. We've got PF Ring for things like Snort, Suricata, and Bro. So you can spin up multiple instances uh, to take care of higher traffic loads. And we've got ELSA. ELSA is a great web-based interface for hunting through your bro logs. And it's a, it's a great distributed architecture. So if you've got a multi-sensor deployment, let's say you've got 10 sensors, each running bro, each creating all these bro, local bro logs, uh, ELSA is going to be indexing those locally. And you've got one ELSA web interface that's going to query all your sensors in parallel. So you get automatic database sharding, right? So your, your sensor deployment, uh, scales as it grows. So that means all this stuff in the previous slide means that we can really do bigger and better things than we were doing before. So you can download our ISO image and it's 64-bit or you can go with Ubuntu server. If you don't need a GUI, you can just grab the command line Ubuntu server, do 64-bit, add our PPA and our packages and be up and running in a few minutes. As I mentioned, we've got PF ring and we've got Snort, Suricata and Bro compiled against PF ring. So you can spend up multiple instances there. NetSniffNG is very high performance, full speed, uh, full packet capture, and we've got ELSA. So a few quick metrics. 
the old version of Security Onion 10.04, we had 37,000 downloads from SourceForge. When we released 12.04 at the very end of 2012, since that time, we've had 34,000 downloads. So in less than a year, 34,000 downloads of that particular ISO image. In June of this year, I released an updated ISO image, 1204.1. We've had 6,000 downloads of that. And I just recently released the .2 version of the ISO image, and we've had a few hundred downloads of that. Now, that's from SourceForge. We get a nice, pretty download counter from SourceForge, but we also have BitTorrent downloads available courtesy of Mr. George Jones there. Thank you, George. Uh, so we have no numbers. We have no idea how many folks are using that. And we also have no idea how many folks are just downloading their preferred flavor of Ubuntu and adding our PPA. So suffice it to say, we've got a good number of security on users out there, hence a good number of bro users out there. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. So like Doug said, uh, I work with Doug at Mandiant and on Security Onion. Um, and yes, we're pretty much talking about using Squeal. Um, and I, I, while I have this picture, I think it is a fair point to note that if you've used Squeal, and I've already talked to a couple people here that already use Squeal, if you've used it or know about it, there's a good chance you know the names like Bam Fisher or Richard Baitlick or David Bianco or Paul Halliday. And three of those four people are here today. And I think that speaks a pretty good volume as to you know, uh, integration of tools and kind of where the space is going. And we tend to see that we're finding more stuff with ELSA and Bro than we are with just basic alert data. <clears throat> but we still do find alert data to be at least somewhat valuable, and we still audit all of our alerts, and we do that in Squeal. Uh, and unfortunately, we have a specific use case that costs us a fair amount of time Pardon, uh, every time we come against it. It's almost a set amount of time that if we could remove it would basically improve our day vastly. And that is having to deal with chunk to gzip HTML. And so if you know or don't know, a server can, re can return HTML in chunk gzip format, which I'm guessing if you can even see it, very few of you can actually read what that is. Um, when we come across this, oftentimes we have to use a very convoluted workflow pivot to another application like Wireshark or Network Miner, find the actual file, and then finally get to the file in whatever editor of your choice, if you're not a heathen, it's Emacs. So we wanted to get it going with Squeal, primarily because of Squeal session extraction, which is really just the most effective scalpel we can use when we're auditing alert data. Previously, we had TCP flow, which was what the uh, previous screenshot was. And while TCP flow can dechunk and dgzip, it doesn't do it in the uh, basically the way we uh, use it. So the best way to do it that we found out was, frankly, just to use Bro and standalone. We're already running Bro. It's already installed. It's an easy way just to get data back and uh, display it in transcripts. Uh, while and this is kind of one of my pet peeves. If you've ever seen like a network forensics challenge online, you get extra points if you submit a new tool, which is kind of horseshit. You know, frankly, people should be using the tools in this space. Oftentimes, if you have to answer a question of do you need another tool, you should probably lean towards no. And right now, I honestly think that Bro, especially with Bro's scripting language, it's usually the tool to use. Not only does Bro already do everything we need to, it's doing it correctly. You know, uh, Seth pointed out some of the things that they were using, like when they talked about SMT, SMTP uh, headers and the actual text extraction, that they wanted to do it right and leave the functionality for you to use it how you want. Basically, get it and get it out of your way. Uh, when I spoke at the uh, 2012 Bro Exchange, I compared it to basically the Bro's core, and someone's wearing a fantastic Bro core t-shirt. I saw it during lunch, and I won. Um, Bro core is basically this kind of elder, you know, HP Lovecraftian god that's doing a lot of crazy stuff in the background. And bro scripting language or Necronomicon, it's, it's how you're getting that information without going fairly insane. Uh, and a lot of this is, frankly, because Doug said, why can't we use bro for it? And I went, I, I had a semi-working uh, application written in C using libpcap, and it was too much time spent that I didn't have, and it really wasn't solving the problem fast enough. <clears throat> 
So if you've ever used uh, TCP flow, you can generally see its output. It will give you a basic header indicating source and destination, uh, basically the uh, network four tuple, and then content. And when it comes to you replicating that with Bro, that's probably the easiest Bro example you'll ever see, just as a you know, scripting exercise. It's almost embarrassing to show you kind of how this is done. Uh, also because I put two HTTP requests on this slide, on that slide. Uh, these four are really the only events you need. Uh, you, they give you all the information you need. You can get your HTTP request in brand's headers. You can get the reply and then print the content data. And just using that, the script is literally, not counting uh, curly braces, maybe 10 lines long. And with that, and obviously some changes to the way Squeal, uh, Squeal's back end works and Squeal's front end works a little bit, you get unchunked, ungzipped uh, data, which eliminates for us maybe eight right clicks and having to traverse uh, directories, which is a significant amount of time, especially when that time can often result in you kind of going off on a tangent. <clears throat> Once we started with that, we realized that you didn't really need to stop at just HTTP uh, data. Squeal, not really super friendly to UDP, so we made small uh, changes to the back end to uh, allow us to look up, basically see the content of DNS requests, which was something we would often have to pivot to yet another application, often Wireshark. And again, bro, just running bro-r on the uh, session extracted by Squeal answered our problem perfectly for us. Uh, and I, I kind of like to show how I do it wrong and then how we do it right. Uh, if you've ever used connection state remove, it's one of the best events in Bro. It's basically Bro's core saying, does anybody else want to play with this data here before tossing it out? And you can, it'll have you know, your connection record, any analyzers that were attached to it. And you end up having to do you know, a little bit of gymnastics to maybe print like a nice report. Uh, what we found was that Bro does a fantastic job of generating log events. So if you ever looked at those really nice logs that are generated by Bro, every time it writes, writes the logging framework, it generates log underscore whatever generated. So log HTTP, log, there's, there's log weird. Uh, and I looked, there's log file uh, from uh, SAS file analysis framework. And this will effectively give you just that data that's going into the log file. And so, as you can see, it's an incredibly easy way to get information out when really you just want to, say, integrate what you would see in a log file into another application. And again, it's an incredibly short and somewhat embarrassing script example, but all you gotta do is check if an actual DNS query was seen, if it was printed, same for the answer. And that was able, again, to remove for us a fair amount of just pivoting it back and forth. And there at the bottom you can see, you probably can't read it too well, but you can see the actual DNS log and then the uh, series of answers that were uh, returned. Doing that, we also started to look at notices. Notices are an incredibly easy way to, <coughs> pardon, to kind of dictate your next action, especially uh, something session-based. So much like log DNS or log HTTP, there's log notice, which you're, you'll get, you know, UID, the connection ID, the uh, message and sub-message. And Bro is actually, or at least the people who've written the, uh, the notice scripts, use very succinct and very clear information when generating notices. So here, it's really just using a table that is indexed by notice type. And unfortunately, I don't have the uh, actual declaration, but a table indexed by notice type that yields a set of uh, strings. And here, it basically, it will generate a small table and print at the end. You can kind of see it there at the bottom. Gives you the HTTP MD5 of, I think I was downloading Putty. But this removes, again, for us, another pivot, either pivoting to Wireshark to extract uh, HTML, or sorry, HTTP object, or Network Miner to find the file that was actually downloaded. Going from this, it makes it a lot easier for us to, say, pivot to a tool that we use on a more heavy basis, like ELSA, and look up MD5s. So to wrap up my incredibly nervous and quick talking segment of my presentation, which is surprising, no swearing. If you watch my Tunes Oil videos, a lot of swearing. Uh, 
I, again, would want to iterate, you probably don't need to write a new tool. The, and the, there was a discussion recently, uh, I think it was in Bro's IRC channel. We were trying to think of anyone who's done anything even similar to what Bro has with its scripting language, and no one's been able to come up with something. I suggested uh, Luigit and uh, Suricata, and it's frankly not really that, it doesn't really even compare. You can spend a incredibly short amount of time integrating Bro's output or just the contents of a post script into an already existing application and generally trust that the devs are going to stay out of your way. There's a fair chance that what you'll write, you'll hear the words, yeah, I broke that from Seth. But usually they'll break it in a somewhat better, um, somewhat better solution. So, thank you. So I want to go back to what Scott said here uh, in talking about do we need a new tool and uh, just reiterate the point that you know this, is, this was just a very small use case of, of what Scott just described. And I think as time goes on, we're going to find all these little bitty use cases that all of these 30,000 plus Security Onion users come to us and say, well, wouldn't it be great if we could write a little tiny bro script that would do X or do Y and integrate that right into the distro so that, you know, without even any bro scripting knowledge, these newbies can have this extra analysis at their fingertips. So that's kind of what we're kind of talking about today. And in addition to that, coming up with ways of, uh, in, in this example, another use case of how to use Bro to help us scale the distro even further. So I, I talked before about some examples of how we made the distro bigger and better, more enterprise worthy, but let's come up with ways of identifying our current deficiencies and making those better using Bro. So Scott was talking to you about, in, in Squeal we have this process of taking one data type, whether that's an IDS alert or a piece of session data or something within Squeal, and pivoting to full packet capture, going and retrieving that transcript from our full packet, cap full packet capture store. So that's great for Squeal, but we do have users who, for whatever reason, they would prefer not to use Squeal. Uh, maybe they don't want to run this tickle TK client on their desktop. They'd rather have a web interface. And so maybe they want to spend most of their time in Elsa. And maybe you, as a bro community, maybe you kind of fit into this uh, scenario because you may not, I know a lot of you guys don't even run Snort or Suricata or any kind of IDS alerting, so you may not care about having Squeal or some real-time alert viewer you really just want a web interface to capture and index and search all of your bro logs. And so that's what we're going to talk about is, well, how do we go from this web interface with a bro log, and so in this case we've got some uh, bro notices, how do we take that bro notice and say, show me the entire transcript from that uh, TCP session? So the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out where exactly is that PCAP? Because we could have 10 sensors, we could have 100 sensors, and each of them are doing full packet capture. And all of those PCAPs stay local on the sensor itself. So we have to determine, okay, for this particular TCP stream from this IP address to this IP address, where did we actually see it in our enterprise, in our army of sensors? So we had a, an initial interim solution. Uh, so I said, well, you know what, we've got this uh, SAN CP table inside of our Squeal database. So we've got a tool called PRADS, which takes session data and writes it into the SAN CP table. When it's written into the SAN CP table, it actually has the sensor name where it was seen. So we can actually use that as an index to say, okay, let's go query the table, find source IP, destination IP, and then just grab the sensor name out of that, that's where we go request the PCAP from. Well, that's great, it worked. It was a very simple, quick and dirty Band-Aid solution. Uh, we have this web interface called CapMe, which Paul Halliday wrote for us, and so it was a minimal amount of coding that was required for CapMe to get this up and running, 
and really no other change is necessary outside of CAPME to make this work. However, there were some disadvantages. Uh, so in this case, if you are really a bro guy and you just want to run bro, you don't necessarily want to have to run prads in addition to bro just so you can do your lookups. In addition to that, we don't compile prads with PF ring, so there's going to be a certain point at which prads just starts dropping packets. And in addition to that, the way that this is architected, this SAN CP table is in the squeal database. That squeal database is one single central MySQL database for your entire deployment. So if you can imagine if you've got 10 or 100 sensors and each monitoring a good amount of traffic, that table gets pretty big pretty fast, right? So that becomes a problem. So how do we fix it? Well, I was sitting around thinking one day and I was like, you know what, if we could take and basically replicate that functionality but using bros con log, right? So all we'd have to do is take bros con log and extend that particular log and at the end of the log put in host name and interface. Okay, well that, that would kind of replicate the index that we were using uh, the SAN CP table for. And uh, the great thing is because, as I mentioned before, from our, an architectural standpoint, each sensor has its own bro logs and its own index. And so all that stuff, each sensor has its own database, so you're not having a single central bloated database anymore. So all we have to do is extend bros con log. Okay, no problem. Then extend CAPME so that when you go and search CAPME for this particular stream, instead of going and searching that SAN CP table, it's just going to issue a query to ELSA. ELSA is going to say, yep, I found it. Here's your log. And then CAPME is going to strip off the very end of that log to get the host name and the interface. So the great thing is we no longer require prads. So that means that you guys can run a bro-only sensor, and that's awesome. And of course, Bro is compiled with PF ring, so it scales much better. So, how do we do what we said we were going to do? Well, we have to extend Bro's con log. So, you remember before lunch when Seth was talking about me complaining about the whole BPF situation? So, Seth wrote these great little scripts, one called hostname and one called interface, because we've got this BPF file at Etsy NSM and the sensor name, which is just the host name hyphen interface slash bpf-bro.conf. So Seth looked at that and said, okay, I just need to determine the system's host name. I need to determine the interface that that particular bro worker is listening on. And then I can determine the file system path for that BPF file. So that's what he did. And those scripts work great. Thank you, Seth. So I said, well, if they work for doing that, for determining the BPF location, I can just use those scripts and add those to the con log, right? So here's my little script called con add sensor name dot bro. And all we do is change our connection record so that we're now logging the host name hyphen interface. Gives us all the information we need, right? So the end result is that you are logged into Elsa you have a bro log that's interesting to you. You want to pull that entire TCP stream. So you go click info, get PCAP. It pivots you to this CAPME web interface. And on the back end, it's doing all the hard work for you. It's issuing the query to ELSA. ELSA goes and searches all of your sensors, pulls back the con log, which matches the IP addresses that you requested, pulls off the host name and interface. And in the, in the back end, it requests a, a PCAP transcript from that particular sensor that particular interface, pulls it back, and renders it in your browser. And this all happens in a couple of seconds. So, don't believe me? Let's do it. All right, so, make sure my internet is turned off. So, I've got here a Security Onion virtual machine. This is running our latest 12.04.2 ISO image. It's got all the latest and greatest code. All the stuff that we've talked about thus far is already in the ISO image. So if you want to go and download this and play with it, you'll have it. What I've done so far is I've run through the standard Ubuntu installer, which only takes a couple of minutes. I've rebooted into the installation. I've run through setup phase one. So we have this setup wizard here, and it's got two phases. The first of which is identifying your management and your sniffing interfaces. 
So for your sniffing interfaces, we're automatically going to optimize those interfaces by disabling any NIC offloading functions, you know, the TSO, the GRO, all that good stuff. So we've already done that and we've rebooted. And so now I'm going to go into setup phase two. Now keep in mind, this is, a, this is a very simplistic setup wizard. The idea is that any Windows admin can use this to deploy Bro on his network, right? So would you like to continue? Yes, I would. It looks like you've already configured your network interfaces. Would you like to skip network configuration? Yes, I would. Now, would you like to use quick setup or advanced setup? Now, if you answer quick setup here, it's going to ask you the absolute bare minimum number of questions to get you up and running. But it's going to turn on every single service that we have available. Now, this is great for just playing with it for the first time or like a classroom environment. But if you're actually deploying in production, you want to run advanced setup. So that's what we're going to do. So the next option we have, if this is your first box in a production deployment, you're going to want to choose server. Okay, that's going to set up your first primary central server that all the sensors report into. If you've already done that and you're just building a sensor, you choose sensor. If you want to build a box that's both of those, you choose standalone. So that's what we're going to do. What would you like your username to be? Enter your email address. Create a password. Which IDS engine would you like to use? It doesn't really matter because we're not actually going to use one. Which network interface should be monitored? So in this VM, I've got two NICs. ETH0 is my management interface, and ETH1 is my sniffing interface, so I'm going to choose ETH1. Would you like to enable the IDS engine? No. I don't want Snort. I don't want Suricata. I'm going to disable that. Would you like to enable Bro? Why, of course I do. Now, I said before that we've got Bro compiled with PFRink. So what is happening here is Bro detects that I've got more than one CPU core. So it says, hey, you've got more than one CPU core. How many of those would you like to use for Bro? So in this case, we're just going to say one. But if you had a, a big, nasty, beefy server, you could spin a, a whole bunch of processes up. Would you like to enable HTTP agent? No, we don't need that. We don't need Argus. We don't need Prads. We would like full packet capture. So we're going to turn that on. We're going to roll our PCAP files at 150 megabytes. And we're going to purge our disk once it hits 90% disk usage. And would you like to enable ELSA? Yes, I would. That's it. We've answered all the questions. So setup is now confirming all of our choices. Would you like to continue? Yes. So now on the back end, uh, the setup wizard is configuring all of our services. It's creating a squeal server. So uh, even though we're not actually going to use the squeal client, Squeal D, the Squeal server, is what we're using for all of our backend PCAP agent communication. So when we actually log into ELSA and request a PCAP, that request goes to Squeal D, it goes out to the sensor, pulls it back, sends it back to the web interface. So we're going to initialize a couple more things, and then we're going to start up Bro, and we're going to start up our uh, NetSniffNG for full packet capture, and start up our PCAP agent so those PCAPs can actually flow back and forth. And it should be just another minute or so. Once that's done, then it will give us some final information about here's where you go to tune your system, here's where you can look at the log files, and here's where you can go to our website, check out our frequently asked questions, et cetera, et cetera. So in just a few minutes, right, we've got everything up and running. So we can very quickly verify that. So we've got our squeal server. It's up and running, our OSAC agent. We've got Bro, as you can see there, up and running. And we've got NetSniffNG for full packet capture. And we've got our PCAP agent. So let me check one thing just to make sure that everything is happy before we continue any further. So here you can see BPF cont file name set. And you can see that I've got my host name dash interface. So Seth scripts work. We have hostname and we have interface. Uh, we've determined our bpf.conf, and this is what we're going to use to uh, determine which sensor to go and request our PCAP from. So everything is looking good, right? The only thing we're missing is traffic. So lucky for you guys, I brought some. So I'm going to use TCP replay to replay some traffic to my Ethernet 1. This will take just a minute. And as soon as that's done, we're going to log into ELSA. So in ELSA, we're going to see we'll have all of our bro logs. We'll be able to 
do searches. We'll be able to do group, group buys on those logs. And then once we found something of interest, then we can go and pivot to full packet capture. You log in using the username and password that I specified during setup. All right, so we're logged into Elsa. So now what we can do is we can say, hey, Elsa, show me some HTTP traffic. Whoops. <laughs> Demo fail, right? Sometimes it takes a minute for those logs. There we go. Try that again. All right, now we've got HTTP logs, excellent. So we can say, hey, let's group those by site. All right, so now we can look at all of the unique sites that we saw it throughout our entire enterprise uh, on every single one of our bro sensors. And so we can start looking through this list, just looking for anomalous site names, all right? So what is this Russian site? Well, that looks strange. I don't know why any of my users would need to go there. Let me investigate that. So I click on info. I click on get PCAP. So now I'm pivoting over to CAP me. So I enter my username and password. Oh, another fail. What's up with that? Let's try another one. Well, first let's make sure that our con log worked. Oh, it didn't. Oh, Seth, we got a bug. <laughs> so occasionally this happens where there is a timing issue where for whatever reason the host name does not properly get appended to the, the log. So in this case, so I'm using TCP replay to replay PCAPs to the interface. So normally when this happens, I can re Yeah. So it's the answer to everything, right? <laughs> All right, so let's try our TCP replay again. So what should happen? If we go into our NSM bro logs current directory and look at our con log, this time we actually did get the host name, hyphen interface. So it worked correctly this time. Excellent. So now if I go back to Elsa, let's try this again. Group by site. Grab our Russian site, info, get PCAP. Oh, let's try another one. <laughs> so, that's right. Yeah. So let's give Elsa a minute to catch up. All right, so now let's go look at some con logs just to double check. So these are the old ones. Let's do. Oh, of course. So I think it should be working fine. Let's go to HTTP. Scott, what'd you do? <laughs> All right, let's try something else. Let's see if we can get anything to work. So hey, we've got bro notices, that's cool. We group by notice type. Let's look for incorrect file type. Okay, that's interesting, so let's try pivoting on that. Wow, 
What's going on? So what's going on? We have our host name and our interface. Well, the thing is, I've, <laughs> I've actually done this particular exercise hundreds of times. And the only time that it ever breaks is when that particular bug shows up or the host name doesn't get written properly. Um, and typically, when I restart Bro and do the replay again, it picks it up, which it did this time. And after that, Elsa and CapMe should work fine. So, not exactly sure what's going on here. Something else I could do. Yeah, it is a problem with the timestamp, so I'll have to get something that was replayed more recently. So, let's do this. HTTP, and let's say, Yep, that's exactly what I meant to do. Thank you. All right, so now let's try this. Wow. I know. I blame him. So 1834, that should be the proper timestamp, right? That was my second TCP replay? Because the first one was 1831? Wow. All right. We are striking out, folks. How about that? All right. Well, instead of. Uh, that's right. It works in production, I swear. <laughs> yeah, so in CapMe, when you pivot there from Elsa, we're defaulting you to an Elsa search, which is exactly the process I just described to you. You can also uh, search the event table. So if you were running Snorter Suricata and you were generating IDS alerts, they go into this event table. You could use that as an alternative lookup to try to determine the sensor that the stuff was seen on. And then the first one on the far left that you see, SANCP, that's the original process that we had in place querying the SANCP table. So for our little demo today, neither of those would work just like our ELSA version isn't working. Uh, so we're, we're totally failing across the board. So thanks for playing, guys. <laughs> So grab this. So if I group my program, I've got a con log, and it's got bro exchange dash eth1. It should work. I'm, I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, no, because it, it worked previously. I, I did this demo this morning, and it worked fine with the, da the dash in there. So, right, exactly. All right, so. No, it does not. The only log that has the hostname and interface is the con log. That's the only log we've extended. Yeah. 
Gotcha. So the, the question is, when I start with this HTTP log and I pivot on that, uh, what is actually happening on the back end? So the Catme web interface is creating this ELSA query, which basically does what we just did manually. So it, it takes the, instead of using the unique identifier, it takes the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and the timestamp. It increases the window of the timestamp, so it searches an hour before and an hour after. It, yeah, I think that's probably what's happening. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not a way to uh, to salvage this without wiping our logs and and starting over from scratch. But um, if you'd like to see a demo later on, come find me, and we'll redo it. Uh, but that being said, uh, our our time is running out, so I'll talk about some future work. So as as Scott talked about, we are coming up with. Uh, other ways of extending his TCP UDP flow so that we can take more information and bring it into Squeal, the tool that we use uh, almost all day long. So Bro is going to really be a, a very powerful enabling force there. Uh, we're also going to be deploying more ELSA parsers for more Bro logs. Right now we've got the, the main logs, things like HTTP and con log and uh, FTP log. So we're going to try to have more comprehensive coverage there. And of course, when Bro 2.2 comes out, we're going to be pushing that out as a package to all of our users. So finally, if you'd like more information about the project, you can go to securityonion.blogspot.com. We've got links uh, on our wiki for some download and install instructions. We've got frequently asked questions, mailing lists, and all kinds of good stuff. So any questions? All I hear is a sneeze. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you know anybody doing um, sessions in Correct. So the question is, how long does it actually take to retrieve a PCAP, assuming you have lots of sensors and lots of traffic? So the way the back-end process works is we've got NetSniffNG doing full packet capture. By default, we roll those PCAP files at 150 megabytes. That's configurable. Uh, but so depending on your traffic loads, uh, what's going to happen is if and when that query works to determine the proper sensor to request the PCAP from, it's going to go find the proper PCAP that contains the right time range, use TCP dump to extract the correct TCP session, and generally on our deployments that takes five seconds or less. Now, of course, that's going to be dependent on a lot of variables, the, the number of sensors you have, the, the amount of traffic you're monitoring, uh, but for us it works very well. Um, I, I think there are some folks that I've talked to in their school deployments are trying to come up with ways of doing indexing of PCAPs so that they can uh, have larger PCAPs instead of just limiting them to 150 megabytes before they roll. They can do larger PCAPs, but still have them speedily retrieve that session within the PCAP. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Well, the, so the question is, do we have any loss because we have, we're rolling PCAPs at 150 right. megabytes? Um, so when we roll, uh, that happens, that's done by NetSniffNG, that's not done by our scripts, it's not something where we're stopping a process and starting a new process. NetSniffNG is simply starting a new PCAP file, and any old sessions that continue, it's going to wait until that session completes and write it to the old PCAP file then it uh, works on the new PCAP file. Now, of course, again, it's, it's dependent on a lot of variables. So if you're monitoring lots of traffic, uh, rolling at 150 megabytes is not going to be optimal for you. So if you're monitoring a 10 gigabit link, you're going to want much bigger PCAP files. So it's something that folks really have to tune for their environment.
Well, so it's a balancing act because yeah. in, in our current situation, since we don't have indexed PCAPs, if, right. you, if you say instead of rolling at 150 megabytes, I want to roll at two gigabytes or something higher, it's going to take longer to parse that entire thing to extract that particular TCP stream that you're looking for. So it's a balancing act, and it's a trade-off until we can come up with a good indexed PCAP solution. I think what Doug's working toward is it's a problem and a balancing act until we fix a quirk in the time machine and get them to run time machine, it's no longer a balancing act that you need to care about because it's just a problem that we need to fix. Well said, Seth. <laughs> There you go. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much.